This is me, Julian Evans, when I was a midshipman, posing for a snap in the Menai Straits. I was one of the Navy's first three and a half year short commissions. This was the officer class I joined at Britannia Royal Naval College in May 1980. Of these, only three have decided to stay in the Navy. One of the others who ended that commission with me last month was Nick Johnson. Peter Butterworth is another. He was a lieutenant on Glamorgan in the Falklands War. We thought it would be a fitting end to our naval career to return to Dartmouth where it all started and take a boat trip upriver to celebrate our being officers no more. in the first four weeks there, uh, when you're not allowed out of the college at all. Yeah. The nearest you'd get to freedom was when you're allowed out on this bit. And you yeah. could look into Dartmouth and think, well, I wouldn't mind nipping into one of those pubs. You weren't allowed to, yeah. not for four weeks. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it does anyone harm to be clo was... cloistered up for a few weeks in a monastery. And... It did me great harm, bruised me, <laughs> terribly, irrevocably. I'll never be the same again. I think you will. But I, th I quite enjoyed it in some ways, the challenge of being locked up in one. It's an enormous building and having a very full routine. We could work 20 hours a day. Oh, I found it very it. confusing, totally confusing. I didn't like the way that nobody would, oh, it didn't seem that any of the, the officers or the teachers would actually talk on the level. Monkey see, monkey do stuff. But there was so much to do. I mean, I never, I never had any time to think, certainly not for the first four weeks. We used to go out to those, there was a naffy bar that we were allowed to, to go to on the Up by the cricket pitch, yeah. yes, up at the top. That you, was great, actually. Can't then when you'd finish yeah. pulling your shoes and go out for a swift paint. It was always uh, around about sunset at that time of the year as well, because it was quite beautiful over those hills over there. Remember that? The last job that I got here was on one of the, of the training ships here, yeah, navigating yeah, the training boats. Yes, we've all I mean, been that was a kind of place. ironic touch to come back, back to purgatory for my last 18 months. It was very tricky past the river. I used to one of my few enjoyment pleasures was sailing dinghies around here. And uh, because of the configuration of the hills, the wind could change 180 degrees. Mill Creek was always bad, wasn't it? Yeah. When it came out of Mill Creek, you'd lose all... I've never been a sailor. I could never tell where the wind was coming from. Did you enjoy learning all about those boats? In nice weather, weather yes, I did, yes. The boats over there, the picket boats, are the best ones. You get over to the Channel Islands on those occasional weekends. Oh, didn't you? God, I was so sick going over on, on one of those. And the only way I could stop myself being sick was to go up onto the deck and tie myself up to the to the rail and take a broom, long-handled broom, and scrub the vomit off the side. Because you could see the horizon and you get the fresh air. Oh. I've never been so, seasick, no. I heard the best cure for seasick was to go to sit underneath a tree. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a go. You want to go? Yeah, I think I've driven far enough. Yeah. Yeah. Do we not get the official hand over, please? Excuse oh, me. Sorry. Thank That's you. Yeah, we're steering a course of 010. Splendid. The port engine is half head, so an engine is stopped. Roger, I have the ship. You have the ship. No other shipping. No other shipping. No other shipping. Right. right, so it's topmost. Here we come then. Yep. I think you ought to okay. stop at Distrim for a drink first. Yeah. So I don't know about you, we used to do that a few times. I joined the Navy because it was an option that was available to me um, at a time when things weren't going too well. And life was pretty dull, really. Well, I'd, having had some time in one of the other forces, right? yes, yes. and having left it prematurely, um, I did sort of miss it quite a bit when I went into other civilian jobs. And so, uh, uh, when the opportunity of a three and a half year commission, which after all isn't a, too much commitment, came up in the Navy, then I thought I'd be able to get the whole lot out of my system. 
Do and you... I suppose I did really. The, the sooner I got on with what I'm going to do for the rest of my life, the better really, because one gets on a bit. But you never really uh, wanted to join the first place, did you? Just no, I mean, yes I did. Otherwise I wouldn't have done it. I must have wanted to. But I left because I certainly couldn't have made a career in it. I was so fed up by the end of it. It was ideal. Ideal that three and a half years was just about as much as I could have taken. If it had been five, probably five would have been enough. But I, d I mean, I don't want to be a professional uh, mariner, especially not in an armed force. And I didn't join to go to war, although I lied and said I would. Would it be bad to actually kill people ever since? Well, I suppose I might. I suppose you have to. And I suppose I would have had to, but I certainly... I mean, that's what the career's about. And also, you have to be so committed to the principles behind it and the policy, if you're going to make a career of it. It's certainly not an organisation I'd like to take on. How about yourself, Pete? I never intended to do more than three and a half years. I regard it as a transitional phase of my life. I mean, I think my main reason for joining the Navy was that I like the sea and I like ships. It's as simple as that. I did you like should have joined the Merchant Navy. Did you respond to an advert in the first place? No, it had been in my mind for a long time. I know, I'm attracted to the romance of everything. Oh, wonderful. Not necessarily a mistake. No, it's very romantic and it's good. That sort of 15 percent. Well, uh, big after kids a few pints of beer, big... everything cheers up, including the weather. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's much nicer now. I must confess, so, uh, uh, some of the best times I've had in my life so far, I've had in the Navy, especially when uh, when we went to sunny places. That was jolly good. Mombasa. Mombasa was a very good place to visit. Sure. Florida was flat. Singapore. The diving in Bermuda was so good, the colour of the fish. It's an electric blue fish. Did I tell you about that? Yes, you did, yes. The fish, they have these big things called um, grunters or something because they chew coral. <coughs> and they're fluorescent blue with this electric yellow fin around the top and the bottom. Incredible. Yes, this was one of these sort of parrot fish in um, Melindi, which is near Mombasa, in one of the marine national parks. They were all destroying. They were Destroying the coral there, but they're very pretty to look at. Parrotfish talk. Hmm? So do parrot, do parrot fish talk. If you could get them to sit on your shoulder, yeah. Do paralytic. <laughs> A lot of my family have been in the Navy. Both grandfathers were in the Navy, uncles, aunts, mothers. Didn't have a grandmother in the Navy. <laughs> but it was a fairly naval background, and my childhood is uh, filled with memories of various naval relics. So I think by the time it came to it, it was purging something that was in the blood as well. Have you got any wets left? The Navy was actually the 14th job I've had since leaving school. I spent a while in the Air Force. Left the Air Force prematurely because I didn't succeed on a fighter jet, fighter pilot uh, training. And uh, when I left the Air Force, I did a few other civilian jobs which were unsatisfactory. And really, I think uh, there was more to be gained from the services than I gained in the short time I was in. Are you right there, Jules? Do you want a cigarette? I didn't share many of the motives that naval officers generally have for joining up. You had to be highly motivated in order to complete the training, which can be quite rigorous. And I was probably motivated differently to the majority, in that I did it as a challenge to my own character in order to find out more about myself. Before I joined up, I, I worked as an actor and I worked as a composer. And I always did short projects. I was very suspect of my own commitment to what I was doing. I also thought that my life had been so terribly easy. And I thought that if I had to do something hard, or something that I found hard, that, uh, that it would solve this problem of not being sure whether I was really committed to going for anything at all. I did make myself a deal when I joined up that on no account would I leave. When I, once, I, once I got there, I would stay the course.
teach you how to be a gentleman and how to shoot a gun. Hunting, fishing, sailing, shooting, having so much fun. But above all, men remember your allegiance to the queen. You're an officer first and The Dartmouth, they tended to keep you so busy that you had no time to relax or reflect on what you were doing or how it was affecting you and what kind of person you were becoming. I just went through it um, blindly, really, without having to think twice. Because I knew also that the real Navy was going to be a lot different to the Navy that is portrayed at Dartmouth. This business of taking, of taking young cadets and stripping their personality down and then building it up the way the Navy does takes no account of the, of the resource that you've got in front of you. I'm inclined to agree with Jules that although you're trying to build up <coughs> an elite of people who are able to fight ships at whatever level, in fact they also have to use their imagination and their instinct. And I don't think we were allowed to use our imagination or instinct. We did a lot of navigation training, but I didn't think that that was necessarily well presented either, because one time we were doing anchorage exercises, so you'd write your little plan beforehand and you'd go and show it to the captain, and then actually go and execute the anchorage. And the guy that was doing it, I came up just at the point where he lost his head mark. He'd been running on some church that he thought was right, and then lost it. So he's struggling on the Polaris for his... That's the compass, isn't it? His, yeah, yeah. On, the, on, the, on his gyro for, for the head mark. And then the, the Australian lieutenant commander that was our course officer was shouting in one ear. Yeah. The captain was shouting actually contrary instructions in the other ear. Yeah. And this guy had just, he was stood like a rabbit in car headlights. He just can't. <laughs> look at, at this. Didn't know what the hell was going on. Now you see, so I think the exercise was completely wasted. And you can say, well, we want to see how he responds under pressure. But why not test him under pressure when he actually knows what he's doing? Yeah. Good example of how that training affects you, I think, was... For me personally, when I was in the South Atlantic during the Falklands conflict, I was in HMS Glamorgan, you know, the destroyer. And I was on watch one night, quite late. Uh, nights were generally quiet. And we had, all the ships had no navigation lights and uh, no radar. And um, there was a large explosion on the horizon. Um, I mean, the last thing, of course, you wanted to do then was panic or take photographs or say, oh, what a lovely sight. And I found myself taking the precise reactions that I was trained to do in the event of a torpedo or another ship being torpedoed. And, and so I made the assumption it was a torpedo because there were no aircraft and there seemed to be no other threat. And <clears throat> my reactions were instinctive and almost identical to my training. Um, so I took the right countermeasures. I put you know, harder ports and full head both engines, which is a great ego trip. And called the ship to action stations now, the thing that impressed me most, really, was there was absolutely no confusion when the ship's healing very suddenly and the alarm bell goes in the middle of the night, people are stumbling out from very deep sleep and I mean, it's a good recipe for panic and disaster. And in fact, everyone went to their stations and without knowing what was going on, um, the important people got to know the facts. Do you think that therefore vindicates the training? Yes, I think it does. Indicates. Because I always think there are other means to achieve the same end. And if you say it's the fact that you're under fire and that you're going to die if you don't do the right thing, which concentrates the mind, is that in itself, because it works well, does that mean that the training is as good as it could be? Or that the training is even approached in the right way? Not necessarily, but it, it, to me it means that the training has worked in some way. It's achieved its aims. That's true. And I think that's a problem we all find. I don't know about you, Nick, um, that the difference between peacetime and an exercise or wartime environment was all the difference in the world. In yeah, well, I didn't actually uh, take part in the war, but we were still down there as, yeah. as a danger zone, and in fact it was still very touch and go uh, what was going to happen when we did get there. Was this in a frigate? Uh, yeah, in, in one of the Type 21 frigates. We lost two sister ships down there. Um, and I found that actually the, the machine did work a lot better once we were there than it did um, on training at Portland before. I think the warfare training, the training for battle works and the Navy does achieve its aims. But our experience is that it was a very small percentage of our training. The rest was in the areas of navigation or man management or you know, the correspondence or bureaucratic element. And in that sense, I think the Navy was very backward looking because it looked oh, towards a, a traditional view of authority whereby the sailors were, as they were in the 
most of the 19th and all the 17th, 18th centuries, illiterate. Um, now you've got modern warships with very highly skilled technocrats. I mean, even the operational branch uh, is attracting intelligent, young, bright kids. And because nobody's got a job, so, so now you get sailors with as many O-levels as officers. Or, I mean, you even get sailors with degrees occasionally. Yeah. But with all those sophisticated kids, you, it also meant that the conversations that I had with ratings were always far more candid and actually um, far more to the point than yes. any of the conversations, mm. than most of the conversations I had in the wardroom, who were all yes. tight-lipped and, and wooden, I say all. I mean, I but a lot you. of them were. And the Navy has been kicked, dragged kicking and... Screaming, <laughs> screaming into the 20th <laughs> century. Streets. But, uh, Barely. <clears throat> I mean, my point is that by improving or making perhaps a bit more humane and a little less authoritarian uh, their approach to the discipline, then they could make the successful areas of the work, like warfare, more successful rather than less. I don't think it undermines oh, absolutely. discipline. Absolutely, absolutely. I don't think it undermines discipline to call a rating by his first name, which is something I was always told not to do. A, a measurement of your success in adapting the formal management system into your own personal preference was, I think, whether you actually had to use the Naval Manual of Law to enforce your, your authority. And I, I never had to. In my three and a half years, I managed to keep a, an acceptable level of discipline in my ship. In my whether department. I. Yes. Without recourse to prosecuting anybody for offence. You know, I mean, the very probability of having to do that is very low. It's very common in big ships. Yeah, people get I don't think so. Yes, well, particularly the senior, the ship, senior though, rates troop, senior rates particularly. make the point that, lot of sh that ships are very different. Some ships are very happy, other ships aren't. Yes. And you get, depending on the personalities in that ship, um, a, a different running to each sort of ship, really. Some ships you need to tell people what to do, other ships they get on with it anyway. So, so that would just go to show that per people's personalities do count yes. in the Navy, because... If you of happen course, to get a, a, a gathering of, of good personalities, then you get a better ship. But it, so really, it does come out, even even if it's not uh, obvious. Yeah. So Did no you ever troop anybody? No. I never needed to. I uh, spent more time defending uh, tables, because you'd always get people coming, turning up late on a Monday morning when the ship was sailing, and it was a punishable offence. And you'd have to find some sort of mitigation for them to reduce the penalties so far as possible. Normally, they can't break them down. Yes. The idea of the ship is a community or society of people. It's a very good analogy because, you know, you have the same system of law, you have the same regulations as we do now we're outside the Navy, have in civil society. And in fact, I would go so far as to say that the way that that law and <clears throat> that justice is exercised is an exact parallel with the Navy itself. It's just a microcosm of entire society and I think the ideas and the attitudes in society at large permeate into the ideas and attitudes of the Navy so that things that might not have been acceptable in society 50 years ago are becoming acceptable in the Navy now mm -hmm. perhaps there is a time lag slight, slight 50 well, years uh, yeah, slight as I, as I said, well, slight, this is very small in terms of global history Jules. it's kind of it's significant when you're getting charged 80 pounds for doing something or it's three days pay is it well, you couldn't have a navy run on anarchy, could you? <laughs> of course not. No, no well, not the same right, way. Okay. You couldn't have a society. I'm not. Yeah, you couldn't have a society uh, run on anarchy, but the sort of changes, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the sort of changes that, 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 that were taking place, yeah, you couldn't. would would tend more towards a sort of liberal liberalisation, well, liberalisation, yeah, right. wouldn't it? And you can't really have everything that society's got in the navy and still run efficiently as a fighting navy. Wake up, wake up, boys, quick, we gotta fight them when you win. In the morning, will you be a man? Singing hymns in the Atlantic on a sunny Sunday afternoon. Praise God, the sea is calm and our sweethearts are at home. You're always running boats it's aground, Jules. Doesn't mean to say that. Uh... I ran a whaler aground. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> you the last person give any. They comment? shook us at four o'clock in the morning. Everybody was asleep. <laughs> Obviously, the guy came in. All the lights kept, went on at four o'clock in the morning. 
ferryman had fallen out of his boat drunk and was feared drowned. So they woke up the whole division because we were due to river division. We went down oh, yeah. into the down to the river and took out our whalers. That was the first actual piece of decent action we got in the college. And I ran my whaler aground. We had King's Wear. Another whaler's going I, Well, I didn't take part in much of the search. I had to get a picket boat to turn me off on the way back. When they, <laughs> they never found me. I knew what to expect when I joined the Navy, and I knew just how much commitment would, would be expected uh, through my previous experience with the armed forces. And so uh, when I arrived there, uh, although I don't suppose I, was, I felt totally committed, I knew how to behave as though I was. And um, once I'd got into the routine, well, then it was fairly plain sailing. A lot of the stuff I did I enjoyed very much. I enjoyed diving and I enjoyed navigation. But at the same time, fundamentally, I didn't like it at all. And it's really hard to do something when, at the bottom line, every day when you got up, if you really thought, if I died tomorrow, would I be glad I was doing this? And the answer was no. It's like, why stay there? Except I made this deal with myself. And whenever it went down to the bottom, it was, it was like a wilderness. Well, one of the things I didn't like in the Navy was that you spent so much time in that society, the reality became the Navy, and any time you spent outside, uh, at home on weekends or on leave, it was in fact some kind of unreality. And I was very unhappy with that. And I found an increasing pressure building up inside me to just to have some time to reflect quietly to myself about various things. And when I was based up in Scotland, I was court-martialed because I left the ship illegally and decided I wanted to go away for a couple of days to try and read my books. But the tradition that officers don't have problems still perpetuates. And I think it's unfair because officers are obviously human beings, the same as junior rates. And while there's a very paternalistic attitude towards junior ratings in the Navy, they should be looked after by their superiors to a certain extent and cushioned from the outside world. Officers who live very much the same life in terms of the hours they work and the time they spend away are expected to be made of sterner stuff. And obviously I think that was one occasion when I didn't meet the Navy's standards. My punishment partly was to be dismissed to my ship. It merely means that I leave one ship and I'm then appointed to another one some later stage while I'm on half pay. It's a very traditional punishment and most of the punishment is really the dishonour of leaving your ship. And I found in myself I did feel dishonoured and had I stayed in the Navy it would have had an effect on my career to later stage which was also part of the punishment. Honour is an important factor in officers behaviour and <clears throat> while it's an old perhaps unfashionable idea. Honour still plays a major part in all our lives, I think, whether we are working in civilian life or in, in the military. And that was something I found interesting. I found that my self-respect and my idea of myself as an officer suffered. I was going into it to see what the Navy would do to me, never to go and change the Navy, despite the fact that I had such violently opposing opinions or to take it on and consequently any situation that I came across where I, I would not agree or I felt very strongly that uh, I didn't like what was happening I had to bite my lip <laughs> and if you do that for three years the feeling of release after it is wonderful don't do it don't do it anymore it's so great not to have to and also it means that I, I challenge people and press them an awful lot more than, uh, than before, than before I went in the Navy. I resisted a lot of the methods they tried to indoctrinate you to a certain extent. And because I did that, I found myself uh, more susceptible to well, pain, anguish and doubt in some of the jobs I was doing. <clears throat> I don't think you're necessarily worse or better naval officer if you've been through the mill. I think it's a better idea to keep some of your 
innate instinct or personality if we can. I think I managed to achieve that. I don't know about you, George. That was absolutely did. Absolutely did. Yes. I'm only just beginning to get my joy back though. If really. <laughs> I used to <laughs> I used to laugh a lot before I joined the baby. I'm only just beginning to laugh again. Really laugh. But that's that's nothing to do with the baby. Just to do with me. I'm going to go back to composing. I'm going to write a musical for the Serenade Theatre in Plymouth. I'm doing a rock music workshop for kids in the community, starting in November, decorating my house, watching my baby grow, looking after my wife. It's enough, that'll keep me busy for a while. A good few years, another three and a half years. <laughs> My plan is to uh, carry on with training to become a chartered accountant. And I suppose uh, if, if you go back to Monty Python and their uh, view of the accountant who wanted to be a lion tamer, well, at least uh, I'm the accountant who's been the lion tamer in that respect. So I, I don't think I'll be too frustrated thinking about what else is happening in the world. Presently, I'm training to be a history teacher. I think it'd be, I'd be a better teacher because I've been in the Navy, because I've done so many different things. I've spent three and a half years in a totally different environment, and I can bring that experience into a classroom. I think my knowledge of people is better, and I enjoy working with people more now than I did. And I hope to bring a bit of life and cheer into children's lives, in the same way that I hope I brought it into sailors' lives. Every time I heard the news, I thought I'd Conversations taken from this program and the war poems of Lieutenant Peter Butterworth are together available in a booklet. Send a stamped addressed envelope to Open Space, BBC Television, London W12 8QT. And you should also write to this address with any ideas for programs to fill the Open Space. <laughs>